So here we are. We're recording now. Hi. Great. Thanks so much for having me, Allison. I really appreciate the chance to speak to voters and let them know the stuff that we're working on with regards to the closure of Indian Point nuclear power plant, as well as uh, the steps we really need to be taking there to make sure it's done properly and the waste stored there is stored in a way that can keep us safe. And this is definitely something that we need all levels of local, state, and federal government to be working in unison uh, to accomplish. Right. I think that's, so, I think that's right. Um, would you like me to address the, the shutdown a little bit? Sure, if you'd like to start, that'd be great. Sure. So um, there are a couple of problems, right? Number one uh, is whether Holtec is the right contractor to do this. Uh, I'm not convinced that the process of selecting them was um, thorough enough, and it certainly wasn't transparent enough. And that's a larger part of this whole process, Courtney, is the lack of transparency in how decisions are made. Yes. Um, and that's a large reason why I'm running for this race, because the leadership I have practiced for years and years is a style called shared leadership, where... Uh, communities need to be engaged in the process of coming to decisions like this instead of the little windows of opportunity for public comment, right? We'll take public comment from five o'clock on this day to nine o'clock on that day and, and then you're shut out. Yeah, I call it uh, public, public um, input theater because yeah. really we have this performance and yeah. it's on a single date and it lasts for a few hours and we yeah. have the actors from whatever regulatory agency um, sit there and ignore us and, yes. and check their phones for a few yeah. hours. And then they return to Washington or Albany or wherever yeah. they're coming from. And you know, whatever, ha our input is never used um, to influence any decisions. So I call That's it- different. Public input theater. Right. So it's it's the Kabuki theater of um, we'll take it under advisement, which is never true, right? And mm -hmm. the phrase I try to use often every day is "tell me more," right? Tell me more what you're thinking, what you're feeling, how we can do this better together. And mm -hmm. it's so funny, Courtney, when I tell people this who are career government, career politician, they're just. <gasps> you know, kind of stunned, like, well, but that's not how it's done. Of course, that's not how it's done. And that's how you get government working at communities instead of with communities. Right. It's not that and you I think, to do if you want to do it, right? Yeah, here in CD17, we've kind of borne the brunt of these regulatory failures and, and this refusal to listen to local communities and allow input. And so we have the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission that really just have the same playbook. And that is, we are um, here to facilitate what the industry needs. And so whatever the pipeline, so folks should know that we have at Indian Point, the only nuclear power plant in the country with gas pipelines running under it. And I'm not talking about the gas pipelines like that deliver gas to your neighborhood. I'm talking massive, high pressure, large diameter um, gas transmission pipelines that yes. carry a huge percentage of the fracked gas from yes. Pennsylvania to New England. Yes. And so this is unprecedented. And to make it, even, I'm sorry, and, and to make it even worse, Courtney, you have Indian Point, the gas pipeline, both sitting on the Ramapo fault line. Yes. And your two children. Uh, a couple of hundred yards from that, right? Yeah, our home is 400 yeah. feet from this pipeline, yeah. and their elementary school is 400 feet from the new segment that was yeah. built of this pipeline that is also 105 feet from critical safety infrastructure at Indian Point. And where, how did we get here? By ignoring communities and having these, these commissions, the NRC and the FERC, listening only to the industry they're supposed to be regulating. That's, that's, so that's the key phrase to me, right, is, is, is industry and always follow the money, right? It's gonna come back to the lack of campaign finance reform in these uh, um, kinds of situations. And the fact that our federal government in particular defaults 
to listening to industry over communities, right? So uh, one, I think we need a review uh, to make sure that Holtec is the right contractor. They have never worked at this scale. And the fact that they say they can do it for less money and so much faster than had been predicted is very frightening. Number two, the federal government needs to get the act, their act together on what in the world to do with the um, spent uh, fuel rods, right? What to do with this nuclear waste that is sitting there? We can press Holtec to, you know, to secure it as well as it can, but it has to ultimately be shipped somewhere. Mm -hmm. And the Yucca Mountain project has been delayed and delayed. And this is a federal issue. We need federal leadership to make sure that that happens. Mm -hmm. And then, holy cow, why in the world is fracked gas being uh, piped beneath your home for no reason at all? Yeah, and I think a lot of people think that um, when Indian Point, when the reactors are shut down, that our problem is kind of solved. But really, our another problem is just beginning. And you brought up Yucca Mountain. When Indian Point was built, the idea was that the federal government would make a repository where all this spent fuel could go when these plants shut down. That never happened. And really, transport is not feasible. We have crumbling infrastructure that can't carry cars and trucks, never mind the kind of massive um, casks and storage that we would need to transport nuclear waste. So really, we are in a position of becoming uh, a de facto nuclear waste repository here. That's why we need the Stranded Act at the federal level so that we can tax it. But we really, really need these commissions to do their job. And unfortunately, CD17 is kind of the poster child for what is really wrong with the approval processes for these things. Because we have FERC, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, uh, complicit with NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, right. in allowing pipelines to be built under a location where we're going to have to store irradiated spent fuel for something like 250,000 years. And 250,000 years, right? And, it's insane. you know, Nita Lowy, who is a seat you're vying for, yeah. she questioned the chairman of the NRC during a joint session of Congress pointing out flaws in how the NRC approved the construction uh, or basically came up with their conclusion that it was safe to put this brand new massive fracked gas pipeline next to Indian Point. Yes. In front of Congress. Yes. But did that stop anything? No. And years later, we have a report from the OIG, the Office of the Inspector General of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, basically saying, yes, it was the wrong analysis. Well, Nita Lowy knew that before the pipeline was built, not years after it went into operation. Right. But really, these agency, the, I'm not going to say agencies, because they're not an agency, yeah. they're a commission. But they are basically, they answer to no one. And we really, really need Congress to exert its control and reform yes. these commissions where they don't feel that they are above the law, but they know that they answer to the people and yes. to their elected representatives. Yes. And so, you know, because we had experts, we had our federal, our state, our local elected officials, we had health experts, pipeline safety experts, nuclear experts, all the science, everyone coming together to say, this is a bad idea, we don't want it. And it got built anyway. That's right. Well, it's, we don't need individual voices. We yeah. need, you know, we need to send, we need our Congress, our elected representatives to really take the bull by the horns, yep. take control of this and reform these commissions because you can imagine if, if they would allow a pipeline to be built under a nuclear power plant yes. 35 miles north of New York City yes. with 20 million people in the 50 mile radius around it. What don't we know? What well, have they done that we don't know about? Well, That's we really what we have to worry about. Because the federal government is so opaque in so many ways. And one of the main reasons that I'm not taking any corporate PAC money is not to be beholden to any of these um, industries in this way. And I think it's beholden on our elected officials to be meeting with the community as often as it takes to come up with a common framework for how we're going to get from here to there. And right now what happens, Courtney, is you get to see a little bit a hearing here, 
a newsletter there, it is not true community engagement for problem solving. And who has more at stake than you do, right? Right. And, I and if they feel happen. they don't answer to anyone, then that's they right. can just do the, right. the community input theater and leave. Well, that's, that's just right. Now look, during this, this pandemic, has been what I call a poverty multiplier, right? Any cracks that we had have become enormous crevices of inequality, so not surprising that social un unrest has happened, but there are also enormous opportunities to remake our economy, remake our environment. And one of the things, we're saying enough is enough on a lot of fronts right now, and one of those fronts ought to be about stop subsidizing fossil fuel companies, right? Stop mm -hmm. shipping that frack gas beneath your um, home, and we need to pivot entirely to renewable energy, to a green economy, because that's our way out of this, right? The old industrial age has been hanging on, hanging on for decades. We need to get to the next age. Yes, and I think, you know, the federal, some, a lot of these agencies, or these commissions, the NRC, the FERC, they are relics at this point. Yes. So the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission was originally created to facilitate interstate infrastructure development for electric and for gas, which right. yes, makes sense. You don't want the New Jersey power company refusing to cooperate with the New York power company, but their job is to facilitate infrastructure development. And now the kinds of infrastructure they are facilitating is fossil fuel infrastructure. That's right. And that is exactly what we need to be moving away from. Right. And I loved um, Elizabeth Warren basically plucked from uh, grassroots organizations beyond extreme energy being um, one at the forefront to basically remake the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC, into FREC the yeah. Federal Renewable Energy Commission. Yeah. And that is exactly what we need. We need to stop facilitating fossil fuel infrastructure yeah. and completely convert to renewables. And right now in New York State, you and I on our power bill are paying into $7.6 billion in New York State to bail out upstate nuclear power plants because they're right. not making any money. Right. Um, and, you know, it's like, why am I paying this additional money on my bill when I hear constantly about how renewable energy is getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper? That's and awesome. again, this is because right. the, the nuclear industry can pay lobbyists and right. make campaign donations and get these kinds of things passed yeah. so that the ratepayers like us are stuck footing the bill for this kind of uh, antiquated infrastructure when we could be spending $7.6 billion on renewable energy. So I totally agree on all of that. I have the great benefit of two amazing advisors. One is Dick Ottinger, who created the field of uh, environmental policy and law. And the other is Nick Robinson, who runs the Environmental Law Center at Pace University. And um, they've helped me to come up with a proposal to pivot the EPA to the Department of Ecological Stewardship because the uh, issue of climate is so much bigger than uh, it is renewables, of course, but it's also about um, biodiversity and the loss of species and the need for resilience. And we need a different federal approach to um, all of these issues that is threaded throughout the federal government, right? Because climate affects the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Energy and so on. And we need a stewardship approach to this of, you know, to touch on all of these different issues. So when people say to me, are you for the Green New Deal? Sure, of course, yes. It's not a big enough approach. It's not a big enough idea of what's going on right now. And we have to address all of these issues. The really good news though, Courtney, is last year, uh, renewables outpaced um, supply over coal for the first time ever. So, amen. Amen. So, you know, whether the feds are, <laughs> are helping or not, the world is moving to renewables, right? The country is moving to it. And that is going really, really fast. And we need to make sure that we just stop enabling the fossil fuel industry anymore. It's enough, right? Yeah. yeah I mean, the, and that's kind of the hard part for 
uh, you know, I think when I started doing this advocacy, I used to, like when I heard like, oh, they're going to put a pipeline under the nuclear plant. I was like, oh, that's preposterous. Like the government is there to protect us. They'd never let that happen. And now here I sit on Zoom yeah. with you 400 feet from a massive expanded gas pipeline that runs next to my kids' school. So now they have to practice shelter in place drills and all of this. So like we really kind of are here and just I'm sorry to interrupt you, but for gas that's being shipped overseas. Yes. <laughs> it's, going to to help Canada. You. it's going yeah. to Canada yeah. and liquefied and shipped. So yeah. it's not like it's for domestic uh, oh. domestic use here. Uh, it's to make money and it's their profit and our risk. Yeah. And you know, people are like, Oh, what would you get if you won the lot? What would you buy if you won the lottery? And I'm right. like, oh, I'd buy a senator. Um, because <laughs> that's kind of what it's come down to is like, what, you know, who do they answer to? And so we, de we need to put the fossil fuel industry and the nuclear industry on notice. You know, we, uh, here in um, CD 17, we have an awesome group uh, of people. We call it, we call ourselves United for clean energy. And we kind of are under the banner that like no community should be sacrificed for energy infrastructure, whether it's a nuclear plant or fracked gas infrastructure or oil. Um, and we, we say dethrone King Kong, C-O-N-G, coal, oil, nuclear, and gas, because it's not okay. Peekskill is an environmental justice community. Right. And you know, whenever we talk about recycling here, I'm on our conservation advisory council, I remind people that all of Westchester's garbage is burned in Peekskill. All of Westchester's trash is burned in CD17 mm. at the Wheel of Greater plant in Peekskill. So everyone in CD in, in Westchester part of CD17, whatever you don't recycle, whatever you don't compost, whatever you don't redirect out of the trash comes here to my community, gets burned, and is breathed by everybody in CD17 because the wind doesn't know that Rockland is across the river. So, you know, our health is at risk. Our national security is at risk. Our economy is at risk. All of this is at risk because of our energy choices, because yeah. of our transportation choices. You know, all of this is very interconnected. And if we have commissions that uh, effectively answer to the industries they're supposed to oversee and not the elected officials and the people as a result, then we have a problem. And that's how we've gotten here. And that's what we need to change. Yep. yep. The last thing I want to raise with people, Courtney, is I too often hear people say we're going to fix the climate crisis. We cannot fix this crisis. We can adapt to it. We can hopefully uh, slow the curve in our pandemic ter terms, right? And one of the issues that's so important for where you and I live is the fact that I just saw an estimate that over the next 50 years, the Hudson River could rise 17 feet, 17 feet. That's right over the railroad tracks that go down uh, the side of the river, right? That's um, a lot of low-income communities will be it's underwater. Indian point. It's, it's Indian, Indian point, 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 right? So, yeah. um, you know, part of this Department of Ecological Stewardship is also looking at how do we help communities to be more resilient? How do we build to adapt to rising water, rising temperatures? Um, yeah. And hopefully that also creates good jobs, which is what we're going to need as well, right? Yeah, I think if the closure of Indian Point really offers us an amazing opportunity. So the yeah. Union of Concerned Scientists, their data shows that by in, within the next 40 years, Indian Point will flood twice a month. How are you storing waste for 250,000 years when a brackish uh, Hudson River is going to flood there twice a month? Um, you know, in Peekskill, we built our riverfront green yeah. um, to basically absorb uh, see, to the rising levels uh, in the Hudson. So we have plants that are resistant, like they can be su submerged and s recover when the water recedes, things like that. We need to take that everywhere. We need Metro okay. North to do that. Metro North has no money. Like where, you know, we can't, we can't fund that. We're going to need yeah. this massive investment um, at the federal level to That's make right. our communities uh, resilient in, in regards, you know, we feel that here in Peekskill. We're right on the river. 
You are um, right on the river. You're downtown. That plaza is at water level down. Yes. <laughs> when the, depending on how high the tide gets, we right. our train parking gets flooded. That's so, right. um, you know, we really, we feel that here in Peekskill and we're doing a lot. Thankfully, we're doing a lot um, to try and address that. But, yeah. you know, it's, it's going to take everybody doing everything they can. And that means at the local level, like our cities, but also at the federal level. We need federal leadership on this and federal engagement and a renewal of federal citizenry problem solving. So yes. with that, I'm going to say thank you so much for your time, Courtney. This is no such a problem. Pleasure. Yes. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to folks about the work uh, that I'm doing with a lot of awesome folks here in CD17. Well, you're awesome too. So thank you for your time, Courtney. Stay well. Thank you. Bye.